It's a great pleasure to be here and I want to thank Michael Parsons and the committee for putting together such uh, an interesting and eclectic programme uh, and I hope this forms a, a very important part of that. It's very significant, I think, uh, the title today, A Country in Crisis, the importance of debating it, discussing it, of providing some kind of a forum for an interaction, for an exchange of ideas and it's something that we want to include you in very much. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words at the outset and I'm then going to ask each of our speakers to speak for a few minutes, a few short minutes, uh, about how they view this question of a country in crisis and how uh, they want to approach it. Uh, you might legitimately ask, of course, what relevance does James Finton Lawler have to us today? Um, and we could contrive, I suppose, to simplify what was a complex life. We should be wary, of course, of uh, linking the past and present uh, and making parallels between the past and the present Ireland of the 1840s and Ireland now uh, in a bogus way, um, in a way that is devoid of, of context and historical understanding. Um, and I think Seamus has done uh, a fine job in uh, reminding us of the environment uh, in which James Fenton Lawler operated, uh, the Ireland in which he struggled the Ireland in which he sought to make something of an impact. And that's significant when you consider uh, what happened to him and his legacy. Uh, Lawler, it's fair to say, was not considered a national figure uh, in Ireland of the 1840s. Um, and he often failed to win support for his initiatives. Uh, his political progression, as we've heard, as we've heard was not necessarily uh, linear. He did have um, a brief flirtation with uh, the Conservatives, as we have heard. Uh, he also fell out with many people, uh, and he was difficult in that respect. And he certainly wasn't alone in that, in the complex politics of Ireland in the 1840s. He did find collaboration difficult, and one of the things you can see throughout his career uh, is this desire uh, to get involved in different projects and to collaborate with others around those projects. But after his death, of course, he was reinterpreted. And he was reinterpreted as a revolutionary socialist, as a champion of working class democracy, uh, as an evangelist of Irish nationalism. Uh, and we've heard how people like David and Pierce and Connolly sought uh, to use him and his legacy. Um, but we still have to be reminded that the impact that he had on events in his life uh, was relatively limited, uh, which goes to the heart uh, of, of what happened to his legacy and why uh, it's significant. Many of his words, of course, resonated for subsequent generations, including those who were looking for new departures. And I think that's why some of his words still resonate so strongly, because we still have that feeling today of, of desiring, many of us, of desiring uh, new departures. Uh, and many looking at Ireland in crisis at various stages sought to invoke the words, the memory, the ghost of James Finton Lawler because they wanted those new, new departures. And of course they could quote him, uh, as Seamus did earlier, particularly in relation to his assertion that somewhere, somehow, and by somebody, a beginning must be made. Uh, and that of course is a very strong reaction to the crisis uh, that he experienced during his lifetime and his country experienced uh, during his lifetime. And you can see uh, how that is still relevant uh, in some respects. And in relation to why we are having this debate today under his name, under his banner, let me suggest a few other reasons. He was a man of ideas. He was somebody who had an acute concern for the poor, for the less well-off and for their welfare. Uh, he was somebody who believed in a program that gave a central role to reform. Now, in his case, that reform uh, was very much rooted in the idea of the land and attitudes uh, to the land. But he also reacted to crisis during his lifetime, of course, the great crisis uh, of that period of history was the Irish famine, uh, and insisted, coming out of that crisis, on the need for uh, a new social order. Now, he also, and I think this is a significant point in relation to where we are now, he urged those who had power who had wealth at that time uh, in Ireland, to demonstrate an allegiance to Ireland, to demonstrate their patriotism by working to build a new order. Uh, and of course that was not going to happen uh, in the short term during his lifetime, uh, but it was significant in the long term. And he also wrote and articulated his case with a degree of passion, uh, as we've seen in relation to, for example, uh, the Irish uh, felon. 
Now, take a combination of all of those different elements and you might see why we are hosting this discussion under his name uh, today. It seems to me that a lot of what Laura was trying to do was link politics, economy and society. That they could not and should not have been seen as separate fears, spheres. And that has a, a huge relevance to uh, a country in crisis, I think it's fair to say. He died in 1849, exactly 100 years later, uh, this country, this part of the country was declared uh, a republic. But has it been a republic in practice? One of the interesting reactions to the crisis we've experienced in, in recent years has been an interrogation of what constitutes uh, a republic, what constitutes uh, an Irish republic. And has it been a republic in practice? There are many reasons for arguing that it hasn't. What was achieved by the generations uh, that brought independence to the 26 counties was certainly uh, a degree of stability. And you can credit the founders of this state in the early 20th century with achieving that degree of stability, with maximizing the notion of the sovereignty of the 26 counties, and articulating and implementing a foreign policy which was very much rooted in the idea that a small nation does have a right to act independently uh, in European and world affairs. And they were positive things, you could argue. But those achievements came at a significant cost, and we have to think about what that price was. We have to think about the, the way in which this country was governed and administered, the excessive centralization uh, that was a part of the Irish culture uh, for so long, and you could argue still is, uh, a certain hostility to ideas around change, a hostility to the notion of the distribution of power. What was clung on to in the aftermath of the Civil War, for example, was an idea that the Irish needed strong, centralised government uh, because of the conflicts of earlier years. Uh, and that was to create significant problems. There was also the exalted status uh, that the church had during that period, the way in which women were treated as second-class citizens, the censorship uh, of so much, and ultimately underpinning so much of that, a contempt for the idea of consultation, consultation with the citizens, which of course is supposed to be intrinsic to the idea of a republic. And let me just cite you an example of what I'm talking about from 1957. John V. Kelleher, who was a well-known Irish-American, wrote an article in 1957 that caused quite a stir in the journal Foreign Affairs. The title of the article was, was Ireland and Where She Stands. And what he suggested in the course of this article was that the hostility to intellectual and psychological freedom was doing untold damage in the Republic of Ireland at that time. And let me just give you an idea of what he was talking about. He said, the sad truth is that there has been no push at all in Irish politics since before the war, the Second World War. Instead of vocal discontent, there is silent emigration. And in what emigration leaves behind? Apathy below and smugness above. Now he talked about the silence. He talked about what had been achieved by a round-robin process of politicians, clergy, professional gales, pietists, and other comfortable bourgeoisie looking into each other's hearts and finding there, or pretending to find, the same tepid desires. And he also identified a paternalism that, in his words, required that the general public never be asked to register its opinion. Now, it strikes me that those words still have a profound relevance today to a country in crisis. Arguably, the very impulses that created uh, stability led to a certain neglect of civic morality, of the idea of citizenship and debating citizenship, of the notion of embracing uh, change and ideas themselves. Uh, of course, some were doing well throughout these difficult years of previous decades. There was a network of alliances, there were powerful vested interests, there always are, who were thriving at that time in what was a protected uh, economy, in what was a society that could often be snobbish and hierarchical, uh, and that facilitated a degree of corruption that was ultimately to be identified in the, Romahan, uh, in the Mahan report as systemic and endemic uh, at a later stage. There was a stymieing uh, of debate, uh, and there was a denial often of the reality of class divisions. So, We've got to think long term. As a historian, I'm wary, of course, of trying to identify the roots of the Irish crisis in the last couple of years. We have to take a much longer view, uh, in my view. But when the crisis hit, 
I think it's fair to say that we suffered from lack of leadership. And you could say that we've still had no accountability for all the talk of democratic revolutions and reform that does not seem to be much of a genuine commitment. Uh, we have had ideas about tinkering around the edges. We have had uh, soft targets being identified uh, in a populist way. But I think it's still fair to say that the space is far too narrow for proper scrutiny uh, and for consultation. And we have had deflections and we have had abrogations of responsibility. One of the things that infuriated me, not just as a citizen, but also as a historian, was the common use of the phrase at the outset of the crisis, we are where we are. That would be a red flag to the historian bull, because we want to know, of course, why we are where we are. Another assertion which I found offensive and completely disingenuous was another one made by a senior Fianna Fáil minister that we decided collectively as a people to have this property boom. That was a decision that we collectively took as a people. At least though, we could begin as a result of this crisis to think about Irish decision making, to think about perhaps the rottenness of our political culture, to think about the culpability of us, the voters, in deciding to vote for more of the same uh, throughout these decades that I'm referring to. We've also had some interrogation of the economic mo model that was decided for us. But the challenge coming out of any crisis, whether it was in the 1840s or whether it is now, is to respond with some new vision, some new ideas. And this is not about the economic managerialism uh, that has dominated discourse uh, in this country for far too long. It's really about trying to articulate some coherent vision of social solidarity. And I would add to that that we are fast approaching the centenary of the events that led uh, to Irish independence uh, or a limited independence in 1922. Uh, and that gives us an added reason, I think, uh, to interrogate the past and to think uh, about this country in crisis. So 100 years almost after that, indeed 160 years uh, after Lawler, Lawler uh, let's debate this country in crisis. 